Hey everyone and welcome back to another innovative investment idea. My name is Dave and in today's video we'll be taking a look at a few recent updates on Workhorse, the EV manufacturer currently in the running for the $6 billion USPS contract. We'll spend a few minutes going through each news item and then wrap up at the end to see if these might affect the stock's price in a material way. Just a friendly reminder to hit the like button at the end if you enjoyed the video, but also the subscribe button if you're new, as it really helps support the channel as we continue the push for that elusive 1000th subscriber. So with all that said, let's dive right in. As a quick recap so we're all on the same page, Workhorse, ticker symbol Whiskey Kilo Hotel Sierra, is an electric vehicle manufacturer based out of Cincinnati, Ohio. It made headlines between June and early July when the stock price leapt from around $2 a share to a 52-week high of $22.90, a gain of a staggering 1,000 plus percent. The increase was driven primarily by investor optimism of EV vehicles in general behind the meteoric rise of Tesla, if you'll recall, but also because Workhorse was chosen as one of four remaining companies to bid on a potential $6 billion contract as the USPS assesses its options for a viable replacement to its fleet of roughly 200,000 aging mail trucks. I discussed all of this in my previous workhorse analysis video, which should be appearing as a card in the top right hand corner now if you want to go back and check that out. Okay, so what has happened since the release of that video three weeks ago? Let's start with the recent Benzinga pre-market prep podcast, which aired on July 21st and featured workhorse's CFO, Steve Schrader. I'll place a link in the description if you're interested in listening to the episode, which runs about 60 minutes in total, or roughly 15 minutes for the portion with the CFO. While there was no specific update regarding how far along the decision process USPS has come, unfortunately, Schrader did reiterate to the public that Workhorse is the only all-electric option and outlined why its C-series is very suitable for the prescribed use case. Here is an audio extract from the podcast. What I will say is our all-electric, though, is probably the perfect vehicle for them. So. It, when you think about what the post office does, 70% of their trucks go about 17, 18 miles a day and make 700 stops, mailbox, mailbox, mailbox. So it, ours runs almost like a golf cart. So that's really more what you need. Right now they get five to six miles per gallon. Ours get over 40 miles per gallon equivalent. And we have half the maintenance costs, which is really what's killing the post office right now because we have no transmission and about a third of the components. The rest of the discussion goes on to detail how the company are making strides with touchless deliveries through the use of the trademark drone, the Horsefly, and that its closest competitors are still two to three years behind since Workhorse are on target to produce 300 to 400 commercially viable trucks for UPS and DHL amongst others by year's end instead of just stuck in the design phase. He also adds that a likely outcome, assuming all things go to plan, is that in two years, the company could start producing as many as 2,000 to 3,000 new vehicles annually in the C-Series range and could even subcontract additional capacity to Lordstown Motors if needed. I won't discuss Lordstown Motors just yet though, but we will get to them very shortly. Next was news that Ryder, a $2 billion publicly traded company on the NYSE, which provides transportation, warehouse space, and vehicle leasing, ticker symbol Romeo, had reached an agreement with Workhorse to offer C-Series trucks to its customers. While no order quantity was specified, Workhorse at least confirmed the delivery of two trucks, and that number will likely expand over the near future as customers begin to pivot away from internal combustion engines and the associated high maintenance costs. Clearly, this is a very small step for Workhorse, but as is common in the corporate world, the key to bigger deals down the road can often be achieved with the age-old sales strategy of land and expand. Ryder will start by integrating the C1000 trucks into its rental program effective immediately and allow customers to get a feel for how the vehicles perform without the obligation to commit to the long term for the time being. Aside from dollars, the advantage of this deal boils down to the potential synergy which can be expressed twofold. The first is that Ryder themselves actually own and operate 11 facilities around California providing electric vehicle servicing and charging capabilities. If Ryder is able to bundle deals that provide revenue sharing alongside Workhorse in the future, this could result in a win-win scenario and further incentivize Ryder to push Workhorse's agenda. The other synergistic payoff is Workhorse's proprietary system called Metron. 
Over 60% of riders' top line is associated with contract-based leasing and fleet management as reported in the Q4 2019 earnings. And since each truck from Workhorse comes fully equipped with an onboard telematic system, enabling users to track and monitor performance in real time, this could play a huge role in how rider operates their business when taking the long view. If rider ends up in a position where dozens or even several hundred workhorse trucks have been deployed, management could easily take up a bird's eye view of the entire fleet from a single console located in HQ and assist them to make better route and capacity decisions as well as many other holistic optimizations to the business without being directly on the ground. Along the same lines as the Rider deal is the eTrucks deal, a company also based in Cincinnati. Apparently eTrucks was able to get a good hard look at the C1000 series due to its proximity to Workhorse and was impressed enough to place an initial order of 20 units and will act as an intermediary buyer and reseller of trucks with also some operations within the corporate leasing space. Whereas Rider looks to be mostly targeting California as a base, eTrucks on the other hand is going after the local Ohio market and in particular, SMB fleet operators with some ambitions for national expansion in the near future if the trucks prove to be a hit. For Workhorse, this represents yet another avenue to expand and diversify its business dealings so it won't just be reliant on the USPS for its revenue, although clearly that deal will be transformative. Another piece of news that came out only a few days ago, on July 28th, was that Workhorse's C-Series trucks had received confirmation of HVIP program eligibility from California Air Resources Board, or CARB, after having been certified as a bona fide zero emission truck maker earlier in the month. As part of the HVIP program, which stands for Hybrid and Zero Emission Truck and Bus Voucher Incentive Project, companies domiciled within the state of California would be eligible for a 50000 rebate by CARB from the autumn of 2020, which could prove to be a huge deal, since as we have seen from Workhorse's investor presentation slide deck, the average selling price of its last mile delivery vehicles also runs at 50000 In other words, Californian companies could in theory be able to acquire brand new EVs from Workhorse fully subsidized without a single penny out of pocket. Keep in mind that while this is just a certification and not indicative of any potential future sales, we already know that government subsidies of this nature are partly what contributed to the proliferation of Tesla adoption rates and gave them leverage to compete with existing manufacturers during the early stages. If you've been paying attention to the stock market subreddit, or monitoring what Kathy Wood and the team over at ARK Invest have been up to the last couple of weeks, you would know that they have doubled their workhorse holdings. As we can see from this Reddit post 20 days ago, the ARK Q ETF, which invests in disruptive autonomous technology and robotics, held a total of 180,000 shares, but as a recording, that figure is now about 400,000 shares, representing still only a minuscule 1.4% of the total portfolio. Investors should take this news with a grain of salt, however, despite the over-exuberance of other YouTubers by this news, since we need to keep in mind that RQ is a managed ETF, and part of its mandate is to maintain rigid weighting on all of its holdings. It is still encouraging nonetheless to know that ARK Invest sees the potential upside in Workhorse as a disruptor in the last mile delivery space. As a reminder, or for those not familiar with Kathy Wood, she remains the most bullish Tesla fund manager on Wall Street with a $7,000 price target by 2024 on the conservative end and a high of 15000 She and her fund have already made millions on Tesla, which they invested into many years ago, well before the parabolic price run-up in the last one to two years. Now onto the final news item that will be discussed in this update video before giving my thoughts on what this means for the stock price. In late November 2018, GM announced that it would slash 14,000 jobs and close multiple factories in an effort to cut costs and cease production of several of its underperforming sedan models after their prolonged decline in sales on the US market. GM's loss would be Lordstown Motors' gain, however, after it agreed to specifically buy the assembly plant located in the town with the same namesake of Lordstown, Ohio, for $20 million. In fact, GM themselves would loan a total of $40 million to help support Lordstown Motors ramp up production and cover any short-term operating expenses before requiring any additional capital raisings. If you will recall, in early February 2019, Steve Byrne stepped down as CEO of Workhorse to start the Lordstown Motors company, but this was contingent upon certain conditions as agreed between the two parties. These were as follows. 
First, Workhorse would retain a two-year non-dilutable 10% equity stake in Lordstown Motors and also be paid roughly $12 million to release Steve Burns from his past obligations. The non-dilutable 10% equity stake is a little interesting as that time period should elapse within the next eight months or so and could mean a much smaller stake in the company for Workhorse if Lordstown Motors were to go public or raise capital after that point. Time will tell if another deal will be negotiated or if Workhorse actively pursues greater ownership in the future. Next, in exchange for the aforementioned financial terms, Lordstown Motors would be allowed to take full control of the intellectual property relating to a design for an electric pickup truck called the W15 and also acquire the exclusive rights to manufacture the vehicle. Lastly, Workhorse would also be entitled to 1% of the first 200,000 trucks sold and also 1% of any future debt or equity financing that Lordstown Motors would undertake. Additionally, Workhorse would receive an extra 4% commission on the gross sales price of trucks sold to fulfill the 6,000 existing pre-orders which Steve Burns took with him over to Lordstown Motors. Okay, so what does all this ultimately mean and why is it relevant to Workhorse investors now, nearly two years on from the separation of Steve Burns and his former company? Enter the Endurance, the first vehicle to be recently unveiled by Lordstown Motors based on the aforementioned W15 design. The truck was actually first revealed on June 25th at an event that featured Vice President Mike Pence, in which a prototype was on full display, but no specifications or details were released to the press, and certainly no one got to see it in action. That was until the following ad dropped only a few days ago on July 30th. The truck, which is aimed at the commercial market, will start at around $52,500. A quick calculation tells us that Workhorse would therefore be entitled to as much as $105 million from passive income as Lordstown Motors begins to roll out its signature product. The emergence of the endurance isn't all sunshine and roses, however, as the electric pickup market is about to get crowded very, very soon. So we could either see a rising tide that will lift all boats, or an all-out war between numerous parties jockeying for position. Firstly, we have another startup in Rivian, who have received hundreds of millions of funding from companies like Amazon and Ford, and who plan to sell an electric pickup truck and SUV starting in 2021. Then we have an electric version of GM's Hummer, which is due late 2021. Not to forget the biggest EV manufacturer of them all, Tesla, who plans to start building its electric Cybertruck also in late 2021. And amongst many other competitors that we won't even have time to look at, the Ford F-150, the most popular truck currently in the US, and is set to get an electric makeover starting in 2022. It's an exciting time to be an electric vehicle enthusiast to be sure, but it is certainly a fast-moving and constantly changing scene that investors will need to stay on top of with the latest news and analyses. Hopefully, this channel will be able to keep you in the loop of any exciting and groundbreaking news from this sector, so don't forget to hit that subscribe button. As more and more news is released to the media, with both Workhorse and Lordstown Motors begin ramping up their activities, analysts and investors alike are slowly understanding the full potential here. Six months ago, there was only a single analyst covering the stock with a buy rating and a $6 target. Fast forward to today, we can see there are now six analysts, four buys and two holds, a high price target of 27 and a low target of 450 for an aggregate $16 target suggesting fair valuation at the current market price. The overall upwards revision of the price target over time is undeniable, however, and we could see Workhorse potentially go parabolic if anything substantial comes out of either Lordstown Motors, but in particular, if USPS finally makes a decision in Workhorse's favor. Although Workhorse is attempting to build a stable of customers, such as with UPS, Rider, and e-trucks, ultimately, none of these move the needle the way a USPS deal would and only provide little income with limited upside. In my previous video, I attempted to assess Workhorse mostly through the lens of traditional valuation techniques, but now can see that it is actually an event-driven stock, which does not abide by these techniques, much like Tesla before it. Workhorse is absolutely a speculative play with massive risk and considerable downside, but there is certainly a fair case to be made to open a position today in expectation of positive news. If you're an investor with the weak heart, the stock is certainly not for you, and if you're willing to take a punt, please make sure to do your own due diligence before committing to the risk reward here. That about wraps it up for this video. What are your thoughts on Workhorse today and has it changed over the last few weeks due to the latest headlines? Post them down below in addition to any other questions or comments. 
Also, don't forget to hit the like button if you enjoyed the video, and again, please consider subscribing to really support the channel if you haven't done so. Before I go, click on the top video here to take a look at my original analysis of Workhorse in case you missed it, or alternatively, down here for a look at NEO, another high potential EV manufacturer out of China that could also deliver incredible returns on higher delivery numbers. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.